Hi, everyone. Welcome to our uh, session here at Pneumatic Scale Angeles for the Craft Beer Professionals Spring Virtual Conference. I have uh, my colleagues here, Kyle and Mark and, and Connor, and we'll be uh, talking to you about um, what to consider when you're thinking about getting into canning. So I'll, uh, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Mike Davis. I'm the Global Product Line Leader for can filling here at PSA. And I'll pass it over to the guys to introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. My name is Kyle Kelleher. Uh, I cover the eastern U.S. here at PSA uh, for craft beverages uh, as well as Quebec. And for anybody out there who might be tuning in, uh, drinking a craft beer, fun little game. Every time we say canning, go ahead and take a sip. I hope you have enough beer. Yeah, <laughs> I want to go get a case. Yeah. I'm Mark Saylor. I cover our West Coast. Uh, for me, that's basically Alaska and Hawaii, and then you kind of go from California over to Arizona, then just straight up all the way through Canada. Um, happy to be here, excited to do this. I'm Connor McCauley. I cover the central U.S. and Canada um, for the craft beverage product line. We also have uh, Gigi, our marketing director. She'll be taking your questions through the chat, so please feel free to type those in, and we'll address them throughout our little discussion, or we have some time at the end that you can also uh, bring your questions to us. So starting off, uh, you know, COVID's really impacted the canning or the craft brew um, industry with all the shutdowns and closures and really had to pivot from their tap room business model to the direct to customer, to go sales, distribution, so on and so forth. So today we're gonna to talk about, you know, get into what you should look for in, in the equipment, what kind of partnership you want on a supplier side and how canning can impact or be affected by your product mix. And it will it change any of your business plan models besides going to, to that canning. But first, let's kick it off with you know, considering canning, what are some of the advantages that, that the customer or client uh, could, could anticipate by switching over to cans? Yeah, so I think uh, obviously there are many different uh, kinds of business models out there, tap room only, uh, people who plan on canning long term, maybe not in the short term. Um, all of that was affected. You know, mm -hmm. once tap rooms, bars, and restaurants closed, they had tanks full of beer that needed to be, uh, you know, taken to the end users, the right. customers. Um, best way to do that, I think most of them figured out was, was in cans. Um, to go sales, like you said, a lot of breweries are even delivering beer directly uh, to people. Um, and, you know, there's positives in getting into canning for those who, who were never even planning on getting into canning. There might be people who may not ever stop into your tap room or um, might get your beer on draft at a restaurant. They, maybe they've never heard of you. Now that you're forced to be in cans, they're at the grocery store, maybe they'll notice you now. Right. So you have a chance to make a first impression that way. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, kind of continuing on that, you know, cans are ultra portable. Uh, very friendly for, you know, going on a hike, you know, very outdoor friendly kind of thing. You know, there's even some places that, you know, glass isn't allowed. So it's a per preferred method for a lot of customers that way, too. Um, they're lighter. Uh, cans are not nearly as heavy point packaging. Um, you can ship a lot more can truck full of canned goods, truck, versus truck full of bottles. You can get a lot more cans out there. Mm -hmm. And kind of like touching on what Kyle was saying, I think, Connor, you go more about like the actual kind of like, you know, cans are kind of like a little marketing yeah. Themselves, you know? Yeah. Cans are a, are a form of marketing. Um, it's it's your brand. It's the integrity of the brand. It's what stands out in front of the customer's face. Yeah. I mean, cans have really become synonymous with craft beer, right? So when you make that jump into into canning, you may start with mobile canning and try out some things. What what are some of the things maybe you might learn from a mobile canning experience? Mobile canning, great way to start. Um, first and foremost, it's you can get your product out there get it on the shelves and, and make sure you can sell your product. Um, there can be limitations to mobile canning, but again, great way to train your team, get them familiarized with cans, ends, the packaging process, um, and get started. Yeah, and, and also just the process itself of uh, or how to process your product to get it ready for canning. You know, that's a big, sometimes it's a big learning step for a lot of customers. If you haven't packaged before, you know, how you want your beer to be before you keg it versus before you put it into a can, it's going to be you know substantially different. So getting that experience doing mobile canning certainly helps. Right. And, and figuring out what beers will sell in the market, right? You know, I mean, you might have your flagship, some will sell more, you know, better than others. And you just got to figure out what, what's going to work and, and what to can and what to really focus in on. 
Yeah, I mean, you can learn a lot, right? Um, just by watching the, the mobile canners, interacting with the mobile canners, packing them yourself, you know, but then you're, you're okay, now you've sold your beer in cans, you've got a little bit of distribution, things are taking off. Um, when do you make that step into possibly purchasing your own canning line? And what, what advantages could you get from that? Yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, you're, it's going to vary depending on how many times per month you're canning, um, how large, how many barrels are those runs? Uh, like Connor alluded to, how many different beer styles are you trying to do? Right. Um, so, you know, it all ties into um, moving forward. It, at some point, it's going to make sense, you know, if you think of your owning your home, at some point, it's going to make sense to invest in your own equipment um, rather than hiring someone to come in and do that for you. On the, on the you know financial side, sometimes financing equipment could actually be cheaper than you know what you're averaging per month uh, mobile canning, and you know there's a lot of value you can't put like say an actual dollar amount to, but just having that freedom of having your own schedule, beer's ready to go, we can can it. You know it's, we've had several customers we talked to where they have a mobile canning day, so they are you know they're trying to get as much beer out of the door as possible, and you know it's the eight hour canning run in the morning, and then someone has to stick around to CIP that tank turn a brew over into it. And, you know, by the next thing you know, it's almost like a 16 hour day for someone. So you know, that, having that freedom, with, you know, having your own equipment. Is yeah, certainly that that makes value. a lot of sense. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. So let's talk a little bit about the equipment then. Um, what should the brewery consider not only from uh, the filling and the seaming equipment, but upstream, downstream uh, equipment, changes to your facility possibly. That, again, you might learn that from mobile canning. And then operationally, what are some of the things that the brewery should be considering when they when they decide to take that leap into into canning. Yeah, whole whole bunch of things to consider when you're thinking about adding your own line. First and foremost, um, sourcing all the materials that you need. Um, so you need to have a good can supply, lid supply. Um, you need to have utilities in the facility that you're in. Um, you hate to see someone buy equipment uh, that they can't run in the current facility that they're in. Um, so you need to have the basics like air, water, power, CO2 mm -hmm. supply. Um, and then your staff, you might need to bulk up your staff or have a, a dedicated packaging uh, person to learn that equipment and work with it day in and day out. Yeah, good. Mark? Yeah, um, kind of on that same note, um, one of the good things about having, you know, or looking at equipment, uh, just speed. How much are you trying to produce? Are you looking, is your goal to just sell your cans out of your tap room? Or are you trying to get as a distribution agreement and get cans out in retail stores? You know, oftentimes, a lot of distributors, if your beer's selling well, they're going to want more. Uh, do you have the scalability on, with your brewing equipment to kind of keep up with that? So just sort of getting that sort of long-term kind of plan in, in place is certainly helpful. And, you know, just speed in general for picking your equipment is always a good place to start. Yeah, Connor, in terms of size, Mark brought up, you know, scaling up and, and growing. Anything that you, you'd like to add about that? Yeah, so I mean, we you can purchase a line smaller, 30, 40, 50 cans a minute, um, and maybe go with a supplier who eventually has something that you can run at 100 and then 250, all the way up and kind of grow with your business as you guys grow. Yep. Yeah, and I would also think that you need to also consider storage. You know, you're going to have all these cans, pallets of cans, either empty or full, where cold storage is going to be, you know, all those things. You to consider. So. Yeah, it's you know, on, the, on the material side, you know, do you want to sleeve your cans? Do you, you know, want to get them pre-printed? Do you want to label them after you fill, you know, get bright cans and then just put a label on them? So a lot of stuff to consider when you're putting that, that all together. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot to consider in terms of equipment and, and materials and things like that. So you're going to make that big investment and do all of that in investigation. You want to partner with the right person, right? So not only on the equipment side, what to look for, but on the supplier side as well. What, what would you advise somebody to look for? Absolutely. So you're looking for someone um, to be dependable. You know, how long have they been around? What is their expertise? What is their background in? Um, where are they located? Can you, do they have parts inventory? Um, do they have service technicians that are available? Um, and where are these people? When are they available? Um, these are all things to consider uh, that issues that you're going to run into realistically and you know how quickly can you solve them mm -hmm. yeah uh, you know some of those other aspects you want to look at the actual capability of the equipment um, you know do you want to have a counter pressure machine that's typically used for you know, some higher carb stuff and it kind of I guess we'll get into it more but just 
keeping in mind the mix of products that uh, you want to run. Right. Make sure you find that machine that can do it all um, you know, right off. You know, maybe not maybe not right away, but give you that ability in the future. You know, you'd hate to have something and be using it, and you like, oh, I want to maybe run a seltzer now, and then come to find out it's going to be. You know, what kind of seltzer you can make would be limited by you know what the machine's capabilities are. You know, so you've got open valve filling, you've got counter pressure filling. You know, do you want to have a machine that's using a volumetric style filling you know, like, like like ours? You know, it's it's every mil, every milliliter that's going out of those you know out of the filler is being accounted for. And I, I think you you could touch on probably some you know the other kinds of filling that's out there, right? As far as open air and, and counter pressure, yeah. Um, so basically, um, on the from that side of it, but you also need to focus on the process side of things too. Mm -hmm. So you're feeding the machine, the filler with what it needs from the process standpoint. Every filler is a little bit different. So you have to make sure that you can hone in on those requirements. Yeah, so um, just to go back and, and touch on what you were talking about with the, the volumetric filling. I mean, there's there's other other methods, right? And, yeah. and so what, what are the trade-offs that you may make between the different styles of, of fillers? We want to just kind of stick on the filler side for a little bit. Well, there's there's level filling, there's uh, filling off of timing, and then okay. there's volumetric filling. Um, so, you know, and some things are upgradable. They're options um, for certain suppliers. Our standard is magnetic flow meter, so the okay. product is going to pass through a magnetic field and be measured, so we know exactly what's going into the can. Um, you, that's not always available as a base option. Okay. Um, so it's important to consider. Um, apples to apples, as you might say, when looking at quotes, mm -hmm. um, you may think that someone is cheaper or providing a certain level of technology, and really you need to add that on to what you're looking at. Whereas for someone else, that's that's a baseline uh, option. So really making sure that everything's accounted for and getting what you what you want. Uh, on the seaming side, what are some of the things that that uh, customers should look out for when they're considering a seam? You know, um, the seam is the most important part. You know, I think we've kind of we always try to reiterate. You spend so much time making that beer. I mean, it's a lot of you know, blood, sweat, and tears, hard work. You make a good quality product. You would hate to just have that go to waste because the package is not done properly, not seamed properly. Um, you know, we have a lot of experience in seaming. Uh, we, we use mechanical seaming, um, and basically, that what that means is the first and second operation you know, roles that are coming in and creating that seam. It's being done by a mechanical cam. Um, basically a system that's kind of activating those things on a cycle and it's doing the exact same thing every time. You know, it's, very, it's repeatable. Um, just kind of make sure you look at all the features of the machine to make sure that's going to you know, meet your needs and you know, align with what you're trying to put out there. You, you don't, you'd, you'd hate to, to have a can get out the door and a customer, you know, maybe it's the first time trying your beer, uh, they open that can and maybe there's been a bad seam and you know, the product's been spoiled and Guess what? You know they, they're probably not going to enjoy it, and it, you know that could hurt you know their experience with you that time, and you know probably cost you some future opportunities for them to be a customer. Maybe be in your tap room or find more cans. Right, right. So you know, being that that's so important to to protecting your brand and your reputation, having that support structure, that engineering, that that experience behind it is is, is crucial, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Um, so as far as product mix, um, you know, we talked a, about different can sizes and ends. Um, you're going to have to change over the machine. What are some of the things that, that we should also consider? Yeah, I think depending on your product mix, um, some people are strictly looking to fill beer. Other people are doing beers, ciders, seltzers, maybe kombuchas. So it's important to have, like Mark alluded to earlier, your whole entire product mix in mind uh, when making a selection. And, and again, what's your business model? Are you are you a production style brewery? Do you want this line running uh, all day, every day, two shifts perhaps? Or is this line gonna sit here and run uh, once a month type of thing? Uh, and the different can sizes, you know, products come in different can sizes. We also talked about it's a way to market. Uh, and differentiate. So uh, changeover is very important when looking at a supplier depending on your business model. So what would be some of the features of a changeover? Do I, am I going to need three, four, five, you know, staff members to change over a machine and a, and a tow motor because it's so heavy I got to 
change out a seaming head or is there stuff that I should be looking for to help quicken that process, make it easy and, and things like that? Well, it's really contingent on the size of the machine, right? So if you're purchasing a 30, 40, 50 minute can, uh, cans per minute line, you know, then that CIP or that uh, changeover process should be pretty quick, 30 to minutes to an hour. Um, as the line gets bigger, obviously you need more people um, and that could take two to three hours depending on the changeover for body diameter. Okay. And what would that entail? Yeah, usually they, when you're talking about, kind of just mentioned body diameter, so we talk about our standard can and our sleek can. Actually, it's the same end, but you know that sleep sleep can is a little bit narrower. So you know that can needs to be guided through the machine, and basically, it's anything that's kind of or body handling. You know, we we, we call, that's what we call it. But just plastic parts. You know, they bolt in and out, quick change, very simple stuff. You know, stuff that guides the can out of the or into the filler, out of the filler, through the seamer. So that kind of stuff, um, with changing up between body sizes, is, is pretty simple and you know, straightforward. What about um, end sizes? Yeah, so end sizes is where it's going to get more difficult. And we talked about business model. If you're co-packing or uh, packaging for someone else or for any reason using multiple ends, um, that's where more cost is going to be involved, more change over time. Um, and it's really especially difficult with the can seamer. So mm -hmm. um, we talk to people. They run different can formats with different end sizes. They might get two seamers. Um, for us, I mean, we don't want to put you through the pain of taking those rolls off, putting other rolls on, and resetting those seams. So we've developed the quick change seaming levers. You pull the whole lever with the rolls off, you install a whole new lever with your other rolls for your other end, and it's already preset by our technicians. Um, so things like that are really speed up change over time, and you want to look into these type of things when uh, picking a supplier. Okay. Kind of on the same side of changeover, I think we haven't touched on yet, but like uh, the actual the, hy the hygiene side of the machine. You know, how, what's its construction? What's it built out of? What what can it be, or what kind of temperature is going to withstand when you're trying to CIP? Can it, you can you use caustics? You know, that's kind of having a machine that's more robust like that allows you to run a wide variety of products and, and you know get a thorough CIP between them. You know, if you're trying to run like how alluded to co-packing, if you're running a kombucha or maybe I mean, it's a sour beer or like you know red wine, you know, just anything like that, you just always want to be able to thoroughly clean it before changing over to the next product and, you know, having a machine that can withstand that kind of CIP uh, requirements, you know, it's always something to keep in mind. Yeah, I was, I was talking to a brewer just the other day and, you know, we talked about hygiene of, I mean, hygienics of the machine and being that craft beer is not pasteurized typically, I mean, you have to be careful. You, you don't want to get something in there that could give you some off flavors, reduce shelf life, things like that. So having a good hygiene, hygienic machine um, can really, really help you out there. Um, what about, um, you know, from cans and ends changeover, but also uh, product changeover or different products that you want to run on the machine? What, what, what do you think uh, you should consider in that? Yeah, it kind of goes back to what Mark was just touching on. Um, so if you need to change over your product, you want a machine that, you know, you're able to CIP uh, your requirements, certainly, um, and then change over to another product to run. So um, like Mark said, it's the build. Um, what materials are they using on, on the machine? What temperatures can you use? Uh, what cleaners can it hold up to? Um, so you have to look at all those things, especially with a wider product mix. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, somebody mentioned co-packing. So that's a way to expand your business, right? Sure. Um, so you need to know what the operating envelope of the machine is, mm -hmm. but also on the flip side, you also want a machine that can maybe be a little bit more flexible or at least adjustable um, to different types of products. Absolutely. What would you have to, to comment on that? Yeah, like you said, the... You'd like the products to be as consistent as possible, but you know we know from brew to brew, it's not going to be the exact same every time. So having a mach machine is going to need some kind of ability to be adjusted and changed to accommodate you know the various products coming in. So you know just being sure machine has that capability for again like whatever range of products you're looking to do, right? Be it be it now or in the future, right? Yeah, so and look to the future and and think about hey maybe we we want to go with a counter pressure machine because we're going to be doing some seltzers we're going to be doing some highly carved ciders um so make sure that you're thinking ahead when you purchase the initial canning line yeah that's exactly where i was going with that connor um you know with open air filling you can 
you can run a lot of products on it, but if, if you want to adjust, you're kind of limited to the pressure of the feed, the temperature of the product, and that's kind of what you're, you're, you're limited by. But with counter pressure, you know, you can make some adjustments on the machine itself through the HMI, you know, if the machine has that capability, you know, and, and be able to adapt to different changes in the, in the process and, and it be a little bit more robust. And then also, I think several, several times has been mentioned of how often are you canning? Mm -hmm. So running a, a machine once a week is a lot different in terms of wear and tear than running it every day. And so you want to look at what kind of durability and robustness you have on the machine. And it goes all the way back to what we were talking about early on, which is what, what size line do you really need? And, you know, there's people that buy too much equipment that is sitting idle. And then there's people, large breweries that buy small equipment and run it 24 seven. So yeah. it really comes down to your business model and scaling like we talked about. Yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how having a canning line can affect your business model. You know, what, what do you think about in terms of that? You know, we talked a little bit already about process, um, a little bit about growth and the timeline, the timeline arc. Do you want to maybe buy a machine that's a little oversized for your current, or do you buy what you need and partner with a supplier that can grow with you that offers a series of different levels of machinery that can that can grow with you. Um, we talked about co-packing, bringing in some local uh, craft brewers that uh, are around the corner and all getting together and, and canning at your facility. So, any other any other comments you would have about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you kind of reiterated it. the getting a canning line of your own. I mean, it's it, it could open up a lot of new opportunities. Um, one, I mean. The, you know, like I said, the can itself is almost a little marketing, you know, symbol, and it's you know, it pops out on the shelf. It could attract someone new, a new customer to you. Um, you know, there's so many ways you can use the canning machine, you know, your can or the canning machine to kind of attract and grow your business. Like we love to see uh, places that do like a promo promos for like a can release. You know, it's like it's a like clockwork on social media. You know, maybe it's a every other week it's a new IPA of some kind. It's got a cool maybe maybe they part with a local artist to create the label. But, you know, you see on Facebook or you know, Instagram or Twitter, you know, they, they post the release of guess what's coming. You know, it's yeah. the new one in this series. And then, you know, cans release on Friday. And, you know, what do you know? Friday morning, there's a line at the tap room. People are looking to get their six pack or four pack, you know. So it's, it's just kind of cool to see how that can really people can you know, kind of lean into the machine you know, and, and use it to help them. Yeah. We talked earlier, uh, Kyle, about, you know, leveraging that to similar promos but working with charities or local sports teams and things like that you you have some customers with some experience oh with that. absolutely i i mean it gives you all kinds of opportunities um i mean we basically touched on it but yeah a, ability to partner with ballparks or or do a charity beer or smaller runs you know mm -hmm. um, it gives you all kinds of flexibility um to get your product out there and really promote um interest uh from your customers right yeah, I mean, we, we have, you know, Dan, Dan Coppin is one of your customers at Heavy Seas, and he made that, that comment that really resonated with us especially is, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about it, start with the packaging line first because that's really how you're going to protect your brand, promote your brand, and really grow your business from there. So I thought that was really a, a good comment that uh, just kind of keeps coming up and up and up. So. Um, with that, um, anything that we may have skipped over that, that came, came back into your mind? If not, um, we have uh, some questions possibly, or, or what, would you, what um, else would you add? I, I don't think we touched on financing, but a lot, oh, yeah. of, a lot of equipment suppliers will provide financing, um, either internally or externally. But um, going back to mobile canning at the beginning. Um, Drink. I, I don't think a lot of I don't think a lot of people are very aware of um, how affordable buying your own line can be, especially when compared to what you're spending per month um, to hire someone else to package your beer. Um, so looking into financing and, and all the different options and and ability with payment terms and, and things like that. I mean, a lot of suppliers are willing to work with you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. 
I do have a question that came in on the chat. Is there still a can shortage? If yes, any end in sight? The pandemic. Great, <laughs> great, great question. A million dollar question, right? <laughs> we One year. Well, we're, we're hearing a lot of, uh, obviously, the can makers are investing and, and creating new, new can making facilities. Um, but, you know, it's going to be about a year before all of that really takes place. I know people are sourcing cans from all over the, all over the globe, really. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. That's sure. a really yeah. poignant question. What, what should be um, being considered when you're starting to grab cans wherever you can? I, I, no pun intended. I, I have a customer that, that I can share experience with certainly a learning curve. You know, one, always want to get those samples if you can a physical sample of a can, make sure the quality is as advertised. And then I would also iterate too, if you're gonna get international cans, make sure the palette is North American dimensions. Cause we've <laughs> I, someone that went down that route and the palette showed up and it doesn't fit into any kind of depalletizer. So it kind of threw a big wrench into trying to, you know, keep a whole line running smooth, you know, but uh, just double check all the little fine points and details and that kind of thing. Yeah, I know um, here at Pneumatic Scale, Angeles, our engineering team takes those can samples and designs the tooling um, for that specific sample. And we have all that experience that that uh, we can leverage from all of our high speed equipment and the support structure. So, you know, getting those samples in, um, we can do something with that. Yeah, there's uh, there's also opportunity in, in changing can sizes, like we mentioned. Um, some people are putting beer in 19.2 ounces, sleek cans, whatever they have to do to, to mitigate that shortage in the can supply. Um, another thing, Mark talked about quality. Um, it's important to inform your equipment supplier when you are changing cans. Not all cans are created equal, um, especially the bottom of the cans sometimes. Uh, they have to fit a certain way, uh, so those can be kind of shaved off or are too slick. Um, it's just important to not only find any cans, but find quality cans. A can is not a can is not a can. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Gigi? Uh, so we have another question on how many people does it really take to operate a machine? Do we run it with kind of skeleton crews at this point? How many people can they reasonably expect to have to yeah, that's so, a great question. Yeah, and I, I think it, it is kind of, uh, it's sort of one of those things you should keep in mind, um, you know, thinking about what your goals are. We've seen, you know, uh, with our, with our machine, a machine like this, you know, the intention, you want to have some kind of automation up front to feed a cans. Now that could be the form of a depalletizer that's going to do it, or we've even had people that take a, a rotary infeed table and you're, you're manually, you know, maybe two people are there manually taking cans and putting them on there and be fed to feed the machine. It's more people, but, you know, it is, it, you know, it's a cheaper option up front to get started, but it's just kind of, you know, what, how many people do you want to do? And then downstream, how are you packing out? Are you just putting cans right into a case? Or are you putting cans into, you know, a pack tech? Are you using a cardboard carton? You know, do you have a, do you want to spend the money to get a machine to do that? You know, I'd say it's reasonable. You could anywhere from two to three people, on a, like a 50 cam per minute setup, but you know, that could be more just depending on how you all the different little you know options you go with on the line yeah and i would say most of that that two to three people is typically that loading the cans and, mm -hmm. and packing the cans uh, right. you know running running a, a machine like this is really you know you you have to you have to reload the the lids but other than that it's pretty autonomous and it, it just goes yep okay uh, going back to the can shortage again what about steel cans is, is the equipment capable of running that so our machines are capable of running steel cans. Um, we are doing that for certain applications. Um, we talked about the mechanical seamer earlier um, and the cams that we design in that machine uh, to perform the seams. So if you do need to run steel cans, we're able to actually design different cams, install those in the machine and, and run steel cans. That's good to know. Yeah, it's, you gotta keep in mind like steel is substantially stronger than aluminum. So, you know, if you're running a lot of those, it's gonna, it could be a lot of wear and tear on a machine, but you know, something to keep in mind, um, like a like mechanical seaming using that kind of technology, it's a little more robust, you know, it can handle that sort of stuff. What kind of maintenance does the machine require? So for example, how do I know as I'm running, I've been running for a while, how do I know that my seams are still good? Great question. Um, 
for our equipment, uh, we provide not only manuals uh, and instructions on how to maintain the machine, um, we provide a toolkit with the machine as well. So everything you need to service the machine is going to be provided um, with it when you purchase it. Um, and it's it's simple things like greasing, uh, cleaning after a run. Um, it's it's regular stuff that I think any brewer would be used to doing around the brewery. Anything else? I have another question. Uh, it seems like a lot of different products are going into cans these days and a lot of different recipes. Um, do you recommend that people send in a, a sample of their product to their filler supplier for testing in the lab? Another great question. Um, we, we have a full service uh, filling lab here at Pneumatic Scale Angeles. So we actually have all different kinds of nozzles, filling technologies, and we actually encourage our customers to send in product so that we can fill it on our different setups at different speeds and then give them a report on exactly what they need. Great question. Yeah, and I would add to that the handling of, of the products, you know, making, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I think it's worth coming back to is typically you may be just set up to run to the tap room or into kegs, um, you know, when you get into packaging, you have to consider how to how to prep the product for packaging. It has to be relatively stable, right? And and, and maintaining that carbonation level and, and things like that. Is there other pointers that maybe you can add? Yeah, so I think that we go back to product mix and if you're running different kinds of products, they're gonna fill differently. Um, you might find that you need to fill certain products at different temperatures. Uh, so we talked about this, the process side at the beginning. Uh, maybe with kegging, you didn't have to chill your beer. Um, you, you didn't have to be at a certain carb level. Depending on the filling technology you go with, you may have to stay under a certain carbonation level. You may have to fill a certain product at a certain temperature. Um, you may not get the same foaming that you want between different products. Is the machine adjustable um, to create that foam uh, that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's super important to know your product mix and know how these different products fill differently and, and what your machine is capable of. Yeah, right. We always love to talk about the Zaman Nagel chart. You know, just, it's a cool little you know, reference, but you know, that's gonna dictate basically, yeah, it's a one side of it, it has your temperature, one side of it has your pressure, and then that basically, what you hit those two variables, is gonna tell you how much carbonation you can keep in solution, you know? Make sure that your equipment is even capable of that. Do you have a tank, you know, are your tanks, can they even hit that pressure you need? You know, where you, can you get cold enough, you know, to hit that? So just kind of understanding that, you know, before you kind of try to th you know, put it through a machine even, you know, it's gotta be able to be done in your tanks too, before it can even, you know, get to something like this. So right. just kind of understand the overall picture. Right. Do we, have, do we have any other more questions coming in? So as we get into canning, um, we're worried about oxygen levels. We need to know about oxygen we're running out of of course, that, I mean, that has a huge impact on your quality. So, and we're talking again about protecting your brand. So, um, you know, what what do you what should somebody look for in in controlling that dissolved oxygen, that TPO in in the package? You definitely want to make sure you know any machine, uh, whether it's counter pressure or an open valve machine, should be purging somehow with CO two. Which basically we mean you just kind of squirting some CO two in it before you actually put any liquid into it. You know. Make sure that's being done. Let's get all the oxygen out of the can. You know, and then there's a lot of little features and options that you can do after the fact that you fill. You know, can you customize your fill to where you're going to create that like that foam we talked about? You know, you actually want some foam on the beer sometimes to kind of make sure there's no oxygen in the headspace. So just making sure that these kinds of things can be done. You know, are, uh, under lid gassing. You know, are you going to try to put extra CO2 right on before you put the lid on? You know, it just a lot of little unique ways you can kind of try to dot, keep that oxygen out. You know. It's, it's the enemy to the, the fresh, you know, preserved beer. So there's cool little things you can do. I would just add to that that I think it's more important to um, consider with the equipment supplier uh, what technology and what adjustability do they have to affect DO. Um, a lot of people will just they'll just have a blanket statement on here's what you're going to get, and that's just unrealistic. That's the way we look at it. Um, there's so many variables inside the breweries. Um, you know, you never, you never know where you're going to be. And it's how, how do you adjust 
where you're at now and how can you improve that? Um, so it's important that you have someone you can work with and you understand the process of affecting DO within the machine. Right, so what, what you're really saying there, I think, is having that expertise on the, on the machine side, knowing if I adjust this on the machine, how am I going to improve, um, hopefully, the, the dissolved oxygen? You don't want it to detract, mm -hmm. but what, what effects do, can I impose on, on the process so that I can get the best possible quality out of the machine? Right. And, and another thing is, you know, can you isolate where that where that oxygen pickup is coming from? Um, so can you can you identify why that's happening and mm -hmm. what you need to address? So that's an important thing to look for in a machine. And do everything you can on the process side, too, to make sure the DO levels are low and they reach the filler manifold, right? Because those numbers will grow exponentially in the can. Okay. So if you can keep the DO levels as low as possible at the manifold, the O's are probably going to be pretty good in the can. And again, we didn't touch on this, we touched on it earlier, but utility supply. Are you putting quality CO2 into the machine? Um, Do you have enough CO2? Right. Yeah. Enough, you know, enough supply, so. Okay. All right. We have one more for you. Um, so we're noticing, obviously, we've all seen cans are getting lighter and lighter. Um, is there anything you can recommend? How should we manage that to avoid some of the crushing and denting and damage that we've seen? It, it, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, you, like when you're seaming a can, you actually need to exert pressure like underneath it, lifting it up as you're kind of curling everything over with each other. If there's any dent in the can before you even try to do that, you're just, it, you'll, you'll hear the can get crushed almost. You know, it's, and that's, sometimes that can almost be material handling you know, before it even gets to your facility. Um, are your suppliers, are they maybe shrink wrapping your supply to the can supply you get? Are they over shrink wrapping it? So it's kind of like the corners on it are like real you know, tight. So you get this bunch of dented cans in there. You know, there's no machine that could run a dented can and not have that problem. Um, is that attributed to the can being lighter? You know, pr probably is a little bit, but you know, just sort of making sure that you know your supplier is also aware of like how you need the cans. You know, work with them on that. That's always big. Um, you know, you, you bring up a great point about the lifter uh, lifting the can up to the chuck. Um, so our lifter specifically has uh, spring pressure. So it's going to account for can variance uh, with deflection. Um, so are you looking for a customer that's got a lifter that's just going to jam up and down, or is it going to do it smooth? And is there a process behind it? Is the machine capable of handling uh, variances in the cans? Yeah. So so you're saying you can adjust that 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 pressure or that that force that's that's holding the can against the lid during the seating process. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mechanically, so it's repeatable. Mm -hmm system okay interesting all right i think that does it for our time really appreciate everybody's time guys thanks for everything it was a lot of a lot of good information and uh thanks most of all to the craft beer professionals for allowing us to visit with you uh this afternoon and uh really appreciate it so thanks a lot thanks, thanks guys, guys. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.